afternoon, everybody, and welcome um, to our COVID-19 Children Seminar Series. My name is Alan Schroeder, and I'm the co-chair of this series along with Rajni Matthew. Thank you for joining. I know um, there is a lot going on today, and people um, are distracted, so hopefully you can uh, turn off your news networks and shut down your spreadsheets and, and um uh, think about, uh, think back to COVID for a little bit uh, during the next hour. We have a really exciting session to talk about some important and controversial issues, but I will let Dr. Matthew um, introduce uh, Dr. Mamanada, who is our speaker today. Just as a, as a quick reminder about uh, the series and, and where we've uh, come from, we this is our, our sixth session today. Uh, we, we have uh, gone over a number of uh, topics relating to the pandemic. Uh, and kids, including uh, sessions on vaccines, sessions on schools, sessions on the primary care perspective, and then kind of a deeper dive into virology as well as an introductory session with a, with a panel that included Dr. Maldonado and uh, Dr. Prober and Dr. Pizzo. Um, so uh, I have covered the gamut and um, have some uh, really interesting upcoming sessions as well. On the uh, November 12th, uh, we will have Carmen Powell and Kim Hong talking about uh, COVID and the impact of some of the health disparities we're seeing uh, and racism. Uh, and then um, uh, after that, on November 19th, Hayden Schwenk, uh, who is lead been leading along with Dr. Matthew and Dr. Malmato, a lot of our uh, COVID efforts uh, at, at Lucille Packard will talk about the therapies that are being used. Um, and that, uh, with that, I will pass it along to Dr. Matthew to introduce Bonnie. Thank you, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Maldonado back again um, with us. Uh, before I introduce her, I just uh, please put your questions into the, uh, did we say chat box, Alan? Can you remind me? Is it? Uh, questions in the Q&A. Q&A. Uh, please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. Today's topic is obviously of great interest um, and so uh, please feel free to put in your questions and we will do the Q&A after Dr. Maldonado's presentation. Um, I'm going to uh, provide a brief introduction to Dr. Maldonado um, because her, all of her work, her accomplishments, her awards are too many to count at this time. Uh, but in terms of brief introduction, she's a professor of pediatrics. Um, and Professor of Health Research and Policy and serves as the Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity at Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, she's the Chief of the Division of Infectious Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Uh, she's been since 2008. She's also the Chair of the Red Book Committee, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Diseases. Uh, Dr. Maldonado's research activities have included studies uh, on epidemiology, diagnosis, and prevention of various viral infections. Um, and now, um, more recently, over the past year, she uh, has been leading a lot of COVID-19 research work um, in understanding prevalence, transmission of the virus, uh, as well as um, therapeutic trials, and more recently in the, uh, in the realm of vaccine trials as well. Uh, so obviously, um, extremely um, uh, proficient in uh, COVID-19 um, knowledge and expertise, and is here to talk to us about transmission and epidemiology in pediatrics. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. I will hand it over to you now. Thank you, and I see my dog decided to join me in the background there, so <laughs> <laughs> sorry about the problem. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to, um, I was, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. I think I know, um, we all know each other quite well now. So let me pull up my slides so that I can uh, share them with you. Um, uh, I, I wanted to, I was uh, given a number of different topics to cover today. And I don't want to, I, I want to uh, be able to cover some epidemiology, but mostly deal with some issues that keep recurring and uh, deal with them in a little more depth today. So feel free to add uh, questions to the chat box and Roshni, if you have questions, you can feel free to in interrupt me as we go through. Um, uh, so I, let me start off by uh, talking about um, 
The objectives today, I'm gonna to really just do a very brief overview of the current epidemiology of pediatric COVID-19. As you probably know, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a, um, uh, every two weeks we have an update of all of the data from around the country. Um, and so I'll go over that. I'm gonna spend most of my time really talking about uh, respiratory versus aerosol transmission. I know people have had a lot of questions about that. And I just wanted to give a little more of a deeper dive into what that means. Um, and then what we know about masks, uh, just again, a high level overview. And then just a, a refresher on what we talked about, I talked about before for some of you who are on, just around what we know about daycare centers and then a new uh, review that came out on Friday uh, about household transmission. So hopefully we'll be able to touch spaces on most of that um, uh, in the next uh, 40 or 50 minutes. So um, if we look at the, um, this is the AAP report and you can go to aap.org and right on the very top of that website, there's a link to the COVID-19 uh, section and you don't need to enter your member number because I know it's always a hassle to get into the AAP website because you have to remember your member number, but you can just jump right in and then <clears throat> down at the bottom right of the COVID page, you can get a link to this whole report. If you want to see the whole report, it's about uh, 30, 40 pages long and you can look at different data from different states. So this is just a summary and um, the uh, AAP, along with the Children's Hospital Association, started to put this data together in July, and they actually track it all the way back to the beginning of the pandemic and whatever data each of the um, states and regions of, uh, of the U.S. have been putting up on their individual websites. So they just basically collate what all of the different states have put together. And it's a really nice reference because there's nowhere else uh, where you can find US data on children other than this particular report, which is unfortunate, but they fortunately are now keeping it up on a regular basis. So um, you can see here that um, so far in this pandemic, um, since the beginning of reporting, uh, probably most likely in March or so, some states in April, uh, we are, are seeing over three quarters of a million children who have been reported to have COVID-19. Uh, I'm sorry, overall um, uh, uh, representing 11% um, uh, of all the cases. And that, that percentage has been going up little by little over time. It had been hovering a little bit under 10%. So it's going up, but it's not going up astronomically. The overall rate is also per 100,000 kids is also going up. Um, it had started off around uh, half of this number, but it's now about... Um, uh, over 1,100 children per 100,000 in the population. And this is, so this is age adjusted. Now, um, in terms of the change, uh, they also track the, you know, the rolling change over time. And uh, just so that we know that in October, there were nearly 200,000 new cases reported uh, during that, that month. So quite a big jump. Um, and in the 10 states that actually report age-based testing data, so it's not a lot of states, but when you look at the testing data, children make up between five and 17% of all the total state tests and between three and a half and about 15% of the uh, children are actually testing positive. Um, we don't have any information here around symptoms um, at, from, at this level. Um, when you look at hospitalizations, so this is only 24 states that report age-based hospitalizations and New York State does not, but New York City does. And so it's 24 states in New York City. And in those states, uh, children um, were between one and three and a half percent of total hospitalizations and between half and 7% of all children, case child cases, resulted in hospitalization. So again, still low, relatively no, low numbers. They are creeping up a bit, but they're still low. They had been all under 5% until recently. And then mortality um, data from 42 states that report age-based mortality, as well as the state, uh, city of New York City. Children um, 
were, represented a zero to 0.2% of all COVID deaths. And, and the number, the actual number is 121 kids. Um, 16 states reported zero child deaths. And um, overall, uh, from zero to 0.14% of all uh, COVID chi child, pediatric COVID cases resulted in death. So again, fortunately, we are still seeing low numbers um, around the country. And I don't have specific um, epidemiologic information beyond this in terms of, for example, how sick are the children? Are they ventilated? Um, what is the risk factors? But we have in anecdotal information. I actually have uh, every uh, other week I meet with the Red, my Red Book Committee. We generally only meet twice a year, but now we've been meeting every two weeks. So we just met this morning. Well, we go over what everybody on the Red Book Committee has been seeing in their own region and talk about different issues around COVID and kids. One of the things that we are going to talk about that you might see um, in, the, in the next few weeks is we are um, starting to relook at our school-based guidance. And so far we have not changed our AAP school-based guidance. We still think that the guidance is the same. I think what has changed is that since we put that guidance together, we actually unfortunately put it to, wrote it up in June, May and June, it got posted right before the July, August surge. So people were worried that we were saying children should go back to school. And I know I've been quoted um, uh, out of context saying that all children should just go back to school. Uh, what they don't say is the next thing that I said is if it's safe for them to do so. So, um, uh, and I've been getting a lot of uh, emails about that and I still stand by the fact that if it is safe for kids to go back to school, they could go back, but in some states, for example, uh, surges are happening and it may not be safe because there aren't enough precautions being taken at the schools or in communities to be able to make sure that kids are gonna uh, not, either not bring disease into the school because most of the uh, diseases coming from the neighborhoods and the communities, a lot of it is household transmission. A lot of it is family gatherings. So that's what I'm hearing from my public health colleagues all around the country. And so, uh, but, but there are places where kids are going back to school in hybrid models um, and um, mostly in hybrid models. And unfortunately there's a disparity there because what we're seeing is kids who are coming from private schools who have more resources are actually more likely to go back to school. Whereas kids from public health, public school districts are not as likely because they don't have the resources. So um, anyway, so that's the update so far around children and COVID. Um, we will be seeing some sports guidance coming out as well. Um, there are no new data around what to do with sports and people are concerned because uh, with the winter coming along, especially outside of California, most of the activities are gonna be indoors. And the question is, should we be allowing children to practice indoor sports? And we are very conflicted um, in the AAP because we don't, we don't know um, whether we should even be advocating for sports on an indoor basis right now, given what we know about what I'll talk about later around transmission um, and the question of if whether children should be wearing masks while they're playing sports, if they're indoors. I think everybody feels reasonably comfortable that if kids are outside playing sports, uh, they don't need to wear masks, but the question is in an indoor basis. And there's, a, and nobody, there's no consensus around that issue. So that may come up in, in your neighborhoods and in your, in your pediatric practices as well. So I wanted to spend most of my time talking about um, a scientific overview that finally was published by CDC. We've been talking about this since March um, uh, here at Stanford and elsewhere, but CDC has put together a nice little brief um, that I'm going to summarize for you here, and you're welcome to take a look at it in more detail. Um, but really talking about this issue around what do we mean by airborne transmission and how important is this, is it for uh, transmission of this particular virus? And I have been following this literature and the work of some of my colleagues at different institutions around the country for some time now. And so this is a really helpful little uh, review. So um, we are absolutely from an epidemiologic perspective and I agree with the CDC on um, these things. Um, I am absolutely convinced from what the data that we see here at the hospital, what we're seeing around the country and around the world that the principal mode of transmission of this virus 
is through exposure to respiratory droplets, not through aerosols per se. Um, although we, not to say that that airborne transmission doesn't occur, but it's a very specific situation or situations and we'll come to that in a bit. So when we say exposure through respiratory droplets, we are talking about things like basic, basic things like breathing. So if someone's breathing or speaking, singing, coughing or sneezing, you've seen that classic picture of the person coughing or sneezing, it's really disgusting, but you can see all the, the little droplets of saliva spreading all over the place. And that's what we mean by respiratory droplets. Um, there are all kinds of sizes. Some of them you can just see with your naked eye. Some you can you need to see in other with other mechanisms. Uh, but uh, because they're so large in general, these droplets are just going to move and drop right to the ground. They're not going to go very far. And of course, the harder somebody sneezes or coughs or speaks, um, the farther the droplets can go. And so I think some of you may have seen that there was a an outbreak in Europe. Uh, in a yodeling class. So people were taking a yodeling class and uh, there was a mini outbreak within the group of people who were taking yodeling lessons. And you can imagine that if you're sitting there yodeling into, uh, into a room of other people that there could be transmission of droplets. So that's what we mean by respiratory droplet transmission. Most of those are large. Um, smaller droplets and particles and by small, I mean less than five microns. So we're really talking about tiny microscopic particles. That's what we mean by aerosol. And you can generate um, droplets as small as five microns, but those generally come from alveolar and lower, uh, very lower respiratory tract um, um, uh, generation of aerosol. So when you cough, some of those can come up from uh, those parts of the, uh, the lung. And for example, with measles, we know that measles virus can be sitting in the alveoli. And when those small, tiny, less than five micron aerosols pop out, they can carry measles virus and they can sit because they're so small, they can sit in the air for minutes to hours and they might travel on air currents. Although I have personally not, I'm not aware of any outbreak that I can Per, uh, document that has occurred because of an aerosol being tra transmitted by an air current. What we have seen are people who have been infected, for example, with by measles, um, who have um, uh, been in a room where an infected individual was in that room, maybe as far as as long as two hours before and still got sick. So that is a true aerosol transmission. Um, and so um, that, that's, the, that's the distinction there. So once respiratory droplets are exhaled and they move forward, their concentration decreases from fallout from the air um, and um, they can really just drop off. And so uh, that's just a kind of a high level definition. Now let's talk about contact droplet airborne transmission. And for those of you who work at Packard, you know you're very familiar with the signs that Roshni and Amy Valencia and Grace and I have kind of put together over time so that people really know what kind of isolation we're talking about. Um, and, but, but here is why we do it. So infections with respiratory viruses are principally transmitted with, through three major modes. And uh, sometimes they can happen with all three and sometimes they can just be one or the other. And keep in mind that we are really talking about children, not adults, because for some of these behaviors are very important and adults can control their secretions better than children can. So we are actually a little more conservative in the way we conduct isolation in the children's hospital because children don't always control their secretions in the same way that adults do. So when we talk about contact transmission, this is really uh, basically fomite transmission. So a child might wipe their hand across their face uh, and you accidentally or on purpose rub it against you. And so now your tie or your blouse is covered with whatever was in that child's face and nose. Uh, that's contact transmission. And that's why even though in adults, um, the, the, for example, RSV is a good example. RSV is really a droplet transmission disease, but because, and then on the adult side, you'll see that for RSV, they generally don't use contact because adults don't won't, well, generally, they won't wipe their face across their 
their note, their hand across their face and wipe you with it. But children may uh, inadvertently or, or purposely do that um, to their healthcare team. So we actually would like coverings. So basically uh, gowns and gloves uh, for contact droplet transmission for respiratory viruses, even though we know that they are droplet transmissions um, because um, again, of the likelihood that a child may spread something to you by fomite. So droplet transmission traditionally is just spread directly, as I said, from the droplets landing on your face, landing on your body somewhere. You might touch your that area and then bring it up to your face and then infect yourself. Now, while we talk about six feet, six feet is really based on epidemiologic evidence that uh, most people have not been infected when they have been uh, outside of a more or less a six feet, a six foot perimeter of an infected individual with a number of different diseases. Some of you may have seen literature from air, um, uh, environmental engineers showing that, yes, look, if I sneeze or cough hard enough, that droplet can travel 13 feet. Well, that's true, but we're talking about on average about six feet. So on average um, means that there are gonna be a lot of droplets that fall one foot or two feet or three feet. Most of them are gonna be very close. If you get to six feet, you're very rarely gonna see transmission of droplets occur unless somebody's really working very hard at a cough or a sneeze or if they're yodeling um, or singing. So we generally think six feet has worked and more importantly, from the epidemiologic perspective, we have seen that six feet has worked really well in our case definition for determining exposures. And then finally, when we talk about airborne exposure, I think I mentioned that to you already. Um, these are spread through these very tiny, tiny particles that are sitting in the air. And eventually the, um, the, the, the uh, particle itself will evaporate the viral particle may sit in the air for, um, with, the, uh, with that uh, particle for some time, but generally after about two hours, they will fall to the ground. This is why when we have a TB case or a chicken pox case or a measles case, we try to keep those cases, if they need to go to the CT scan or the MRI room, or they need to go uh, to the OR, we try to uh, schedule them at the, as the last case of the day because uh, we then need to shut that room down. That need, room needs to be shut down for at least two hours in some cases for TB, measles, um, and chicken pox because we know those are absolutely airborne diseases. And we like them to sit overnight and then we do a terminal clean at the end of at least one shift just to make sure that all those little aerosols have reached the ground. Because if we clean before then and the aerosols are still in the air, there's still a risk that those aerosol virals particles might land on a clean surface and then uh, potentially infect somebody. So we don't uh, think that that, I mean, we are being very conservative there, but that's the rationale for TB, chicken pox, measles in particular, uh, being uh, at, at end of day cases where we shut the room down and don't allow other patients in that room for at least uh, a couple of hours. Now, um, uh, when we look at droplet transmission, um, we are talking about a whole array of sizes of droplets um, and airborne is really a very much, con uh, again, restricted to very tiny droplets. And these are, um, I'm sorry, particles. And um, they can also be particles at greater distance or over longer times. And the longer time again is because these smaller particles can sit for, a, for, for longer than a large droplet. And as I mentioned earlier, mo these modes are not mutually exclusive. So close contact refers to transmission that can either happen by contact or droplet when a person is close by, as we said before. Now, as I mentioned, and I'm trying to just reiterate some of this because the literature can be confusing. Aerosol transmission is used in ways uh, that epidemiologists, epidemiologists and infectious disease individuals really have uh, very specific meaning for. And um, when we look at aerosol, uh, we look at these tiny particles that essentially have Brownian movement. They kind of just sit in the air, they move randomly, they might be pushed around by mild air currents, uh, but, they, um, uh, but they can sit for some time. Uh, and in healthcare settings in particular, 
what we worry about in aerosol transmission is really, especially with SARS-CoV-2, is aerosol generating procedures. So for example, intubation and bronchoscopy, where we think, uh, we, we know that people will produce many, many different droplets of different sizes. So this is not normal coughing, sneezing, et cetera. This is somebody who's being intubated or having a bronchoscope put in their airway where they are really gonna generate lots of lower airway pressure that they normally wouldn't do. And that is gonna be generated very close to the face of the healthcare team. That's a very unusual setting that you don't see in virtually any other setting, uh, whether it's a outdoor uh, uh, non-medical setting or even in a medical setting, for example, where you're taking care of a crying child in a, in a pediatric practice. In general, that crying child is not uh, be having instrumentation being done in their lower respiratory tract where you might pull out virus. And so in, that's, in these aerosol generating procedures, and as you know, Roshni, uh, Matthew and Grace Lee and the IPC team have put together a very a comprehensive list of what these are, but again, they are very invasive procedures um, and they do require distinct controls um, mostly, as you saw, cappers, pappers, um, uh, N95s, face shields, all of that. And that is really because we, we're we dealing with these aerosols that may be functioning as droplets that are going to be hitting your face um, because you're so close and you're going to be generating lots of them. Now, just so you know that back in the SARS outbreak from 2002 to 2004, there was also um, some understanding that there may have been sewage system generated uh, aer aerosol transmission um, uh, of droplets that contain SARS, not SARS-CoV-2, but SARS in a Hong Kong uh, apartment complex. Now, we don't really know and we don't have evidence that that has happened or can happen with SARS-CoV-2. People have been looking at stool samples. Some of our colleagues here at Stanford, Ami Bot and others, and uh, Jason Andrews and adult infectious diseases have been trying to look at how much a viral particle can you find in stool samples. And on top of that, not only how much viral particle can we find in stool samples, but can you aerosolize those, those for example, when you're doing um, uh, colonoscopies or other uh, lower uh, lower uh, GI tract um, instrumentation. And so far, there has not been definitive evidence of aerosol generation in those settings. But again, uh, that, um, that literature is still being developed and we have not seen evidence of transmission by that mechanism. But we definitely heard that that was a possibility during the SARS outbreak of 2003. And it may have been that that particular event was very specific to the sewage system that was being used. It was a very large apartment complex where there was a large degree of spillage of sewage and um, a breakage in the pipes. And so there could have been an aerosol transmission there because of the specific engineering configuration of that uh, particular um, apartment. So if you hear about that, that's really the one situation that we know about. And it wasn't SARS-CoV-2, it was, it was the, the, SAR, the original SARS virus. Now, um, the epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 indicates that most infections are spread through close contact, not airborne transmission. And this is why we feel so comfortable saying that this virus is transmitted primarily by um, droplets because all of the epidemiology, all of what we've seen around the world, not just here at Stanford, but all around the world, all around the US, really does indicate that this virus is is traveling and infecting people through respiratory, not aerosol contact. And the reason is that diseases that are spread by airborne transmission have extremely high attack rates that can quickly reach and infect many people in a short period of time. So if you have measles, TB, chicken pox, you are gonna see much higher transmission than what we have seen with SARS-CoV-2. So just on the basis of comparing that alone, you can really um, determine that, it, that the transmission of those true airborne diseases is very different. And so we know that the vast majority of transmissions of SARS-CoV-2, um, about 
uh, are coming from uh, are coming from respiratory uh, infection. Now we also know that a significant proportion of SARS-CoV-2 infections, uh, about 40% or so, occur from people who don't have any symptoms at all, um, and that we know that they can infect other people. So if in fact we were seeing spread of this virus, especially from people who aren't infected or aren't symptomatic, we would expect to see considerably more rapid global spread of infection. By now, we would have seen high, high levels of herd immunity on the order of 40 to 50% or more. Because if half, if 40% of people who are infected have no symptoms, and if they were spreading by aerosol, they would not know that they were spreading this virus. Um, we would be seeing cases where there was no known contact, for example, because you wouldn't have known that you were in contact with an individual who was infected because they had no symptoms. And so um, all of this is put together, all of these data put together demonstrate that this virus spreads really like all other common respiratory viruses. That is within a short range, within six feet, and um, that people that are far away uh, that is farther than six feet or who enter a space hours after an infectious person was there are not getting infected. They generally know who their contact is, again, indicating that it's really close respiratory contact. So, um, however, airborne transmission can occur, as I said, under special circumstances. So uh, when somebody is very close up, those tiny, tiny particles can act like droplets and they can still infect an individual who might be conducting an aerosol generating procedure. Um, these transmission events are uncommon and um, really are either uh, around AGPs, so aerosol generating procedures, or when somebody is very, very close for long periods of time in an enclosed space where there is really not a lot of circulation. So something that could basically mimic an aerosol generating procedure event. So in those situations, enough virus might be present in the space to cause infections for people who were uh, more than six feet away or who passed through that space soon after the infectious person had left. But that person had to have been in that room generating these large aerosols for a long period of time. For example, during an intubation or during a bronchoscopy when the room is still not been cleaned. So that's why we want people to stay out of those rooms for some period of time around people who we know are infected. Now, um, so what do we do what, to prevent airborne transmission? Um, well, it turns out that the good news here is that essentially given the limited amount of aerosol transmission that could potentially occur, the same things, and even the environmental engineers agree with this. The, and the point of the environmental engineers is they want us to acknowledge that airborne transmission is possible although we have not proven it to occur, except maybe in aerosol generating procedures, but they have also said that the same types of interventions can be used for both dr respiratory droplet transmission and aerosol transmission of this virus, not other viruses or diseases, not for measles, not for TB, not for chickenpox. As we know, we still need to do full airborne isolation for those viruses because we know that the vast majority of infections from those are through airborne spread. But for SARS-CoV-2, because the um, interventions that we're using now seem to work, we think that, uh, the, that uh, uh, respiratory contact precautions are sufficient. These include, and these also include social distancing, uses of masks in the community, hand hygiene and surface cleaning and disinfection. Now, but in, again, separate from the hospital uh, setting, in the general population setting, the normal uh, mechanisms can be useful. In addition though, we know that ventilation can be important and avoidance of crowded indoor spaces are especially relevant for these enclosed spaces. And frankly, we don't have good information around ventilation. Um, that is what are our metrics for ventilation? And I was on a call with the state um, health department yesterday and they are finally, they're going to be working with their environmental engineer experts to give us some guidance around what do we mean by ventilation uh, guidelines. And by that, I think what we're trying to talk about is if I, can I go to a restaurant? 
can I go into a school during the winter time when we want to have to, we want to start closing the windows and the doors? Um, and we don't know the answer to that yet. The general answer from what we've seen around the world in schools that have been open, for example, in Europe and other places, is that um, they do close the windows and doors um, and people still are um, trying to keep distancing and masking. But we do want at least some guidelines around what other ventilation precautions can we take? That is, should we be using HEPA filtration in classrooms? We don't know the answer to that. What about the basic ventilation that is used in classrooms? Should that be, what level of, of ventilation should there be? And th that there's something called the MERV factor. I can't remember what it stands for, but it is a, an environmental factor that is like a um, typical um, uh, efficiency, efficiency um, metric for, um, for filters in classrooms and other rooms. And so we are gonna be asking for more guidance and schools do have some guidance around this. Um, but the question is, should we be using some specific guidelines for what should be used across all schools and what should be used in restaurants? Um, especially as we're now going back to in, in uh, indoor dining in restaurants. So we don't uh, at this time think we need special engineering controls. I did, I did include at the end of these slides and I'll post them for you. Um, a bunch of references from all around the world of individual situations where there have been indications that there might have been restaurant spread um, of virus. And it may have been that there was a ventilatory issue, but we don't also know that there wasn't somebody there who had high viral load who may have been quote unquote a super spreader. But at this time, we aren't indicating even in the general community that we'd special, practice special engineering controls. Um, so again, uh, just to recap, in closed spaces where somebody has been sitting for long, long periods of time who may have high viral loads could be a potential uh, risk for airborne transmission. And I'll show you those references. There are not a lot of those instances that we've documented, despite the fact that we have over 40 million cases of virus around the world. We know that the vast majority of those have occurred through the usual routes of no masking, no social distancing, and no hand hygiene. Um, and so I will um, leave that subject at that point. Now, some critical questions though that we still need to understand for which people are really trying to do studies, but which, uh, which we really don't have good answers for are how effective, as I mentioned, are certain mitigations, like what kind of ventilation is the best ventilation? And what masking is the best masking? Now, of course, in theory, you could say, well, everyone should walk around with an N95 all the time, but that's, first of all, not practical. Secondly, it's likely not necessary 99.99% of the time. As I said, we have over 40 million cases of virus in the world, and people are not spreading virus when they're masking with regular cloth masks um, outside of the hospital setting and staying six feet apart. Um, but the purport, it would be also nice to know what small proportion of these infections can be acquired from true airborne transmission and what are the conditions that facilitate that? Do you need to have a certain viral load? Do you need to be exposed for a certain number of minutes or more? What kind of ventilation is, is happening in those uh, transmission events? And even more fundamentally, we still don't know what is the infectious dose for SARS-CoV-2. That is how many viral particles do you really need to infect a person? Now you can do those studies in hamsters, mice, ferrets. I understand now that minks, which are related to the weasel family are actually good transmitters of this virus, but we don't know that what happens in a mink or a ferret is the same as what will happen in an individual person. And there are, um, People have been talking, especially the people at the, university, the UK, um, at the University of Oxford, they've been talking about doing challenge studies, which um, I think is very uh, brave. That is taking known doses of virus and giving them to individual people to see how much virus you need to give somebody for them to get infected. Um, now, those are challenge studies, so they're going to actually give people vaccine first and then challenge them. But the problem is we still don't know if the vaccines work. So again, very brave studies and hopefully they'll do those studies after they prove that the vaccines have some efficacy. 
Um, now, do inoculum size and route of inoculum affect risk of infection and disease severity? We don't know the answer to that either. That has been postulated, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit. So what do the data say? So we've talked about aerosols. We've talked about droplets. What about face masks? What do the data say? Well, there aren't great data around masks, but I will show you some data that really do support the fact that masks are working. So first of all, we know that N95 masks in a hospital setting where we are doing aerosol generating procedures, we know that by the very definition of what an N95 mask is, is that filters out 95% of particles. That's why they're called N95s. So we have N100s as well, but we don't really use those. Those are very hard to get and we don't need those in a hospital setting. In addition, very early on in the pandemic, um, I pulled out some data looking at what kinds of vi viral particles do N95s filter. And it turns out that the, that the limit, the lower limit of protection is 30 microns. Uh, we know that this virus is about 120 microns. So it is well, it's four times bigger than the lower limit of the, ma of the mask filtration. So if you're wearing an N95, you are super protected if you're wearing it properly you're super protected from uh, the, uh, the virus since it's four times bigger than the, part, than the particles, uh, the limit of the, the particle that can be filtered by an N95. In addition, these are certified by OSHA and by Cal OSHA, um, and they have been put through tests to show that they can filter these viral particles or particles of this size. The other thing we know about masks is um, there was a, I think I demonstrated, talked about this a few uh, months ago. There was an MMWR report from Springfield, Missouri, demonstrating that there were three salon workers, hair salon workers who were symptomatic with SARS-CoV-2. They wore double masks at work um, and they uh, took care of about 140 clients over a one eight hour period of time. Um, and they had very close contact, as any of you who go to hair salons know, you are sitting pretty close face-to-face -face with the person who's do, uh, doing your work. And um, no, none of their 100 and, uh, almost 150 um, clients actually demonstrated evidence of infection or symptoms, whereas it, is very, it was known for sure that those two uh, workers who went home sick and didn't mask at home infected their family members. So we do have that evidence. Um, granted, it is one event, but we know that uh, in that situation, these were individuals who did not spread virus uh, to a large number of individuals from where, where they were close to them and yet did spread virus to people at home. Now, we also know from the Georgia summer, and I'm only, I, I'm only providing very high level um, examples here. We know that there are many, there are other case reports of these kinds of situations, but I'm giving you some of the higher end of uh, cases that really demonstrate the point that masks do work. Now we know that in the Georgia summer camps over the summer, there was a very large uh, summer camp experience where uh, masks were supposed to be used, but it turns out that they were not enforced at all and nobody was wearing masks. That camp had to shut down within a week because there were hundreds of infections um, throughout the entire camp. Um, and um, I don't think they were able to identify one source, but there were lots of, uh, there was no mask wearing. So we know that the converse is true, that when you don't wear masks, uh, that you can transmit. And we do know that the use of masks um, can prevent particles from traveling. Now, Here's another study from Emerging Infectious Diseases. It was a case control study of the use of PPE and risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection in Thailand. And sorry, I tried to make this table look better than it does, but this is really a, a slide at the bottom showing odds ratios for infection. And so the odds ratios go from 0 0.01 all the way up to 10. So this is a logarithmic scale. And so of course, the further on the right you are, the more likely you are to trends to develop infection. So in these um, particular studies, people who always wore a mask were um, less likely to transmit, but people who sometimes wore a mask were 
um, actually very likely, as likely to trans, where I'm as likely to get infected as people who never wore a mask. Uh, whereas we saw a significant reduction. So this number doesn't cross one. So they actually had a 70% uh, lower risk of being infected than the person who said they sometimes wore a mask. So if you're gonna sometimes wear a mask, it's the same, at least statistically, as never wearing a mask, at least from this particular study. Um, often washing hands and sometimes washing hands actually were equivalent in protection. They were 70% protective. So they were, so often sometimes washing your hands and always wearing a mask were predictive of a re ma major reduction, a 70% reduction in infection among con people who were, had contact tracing. Now, again, we also see that uh, greater than one meter of distance without physical contact was extremely protective as well. And having physical contact obviously was, uh, uh, had a, uh, a risk uh, for transmission. So this is a really nice study because it involved uh, thousands of individuals who were contact traced in Thailand by the Thai, Thai Health Department. Now, here's another study uh, that it, I have to admit this in full disclosure, this study is, um, is not peer reviewed yet, but it came out in Med Archives and um, it is a, looks pretty good to me, but uh, again, I, I am not the peer reviewer of this study. study. So this study uh, looked at determining sources of variation within countries of in capita mortality. So they looked at mortality from COVID-19 and they looked at a whole bunch of predictors, which you can see here. I won't go through them all. You can look at this later. I'll have the slides posted. But in a multivariate analysis of 196 countries, um, they, uh, they looked at um, uh, what factors were associated with higher or lower mortality and duration of infection in the country and the proportion of people 60 of, or older were positively associated with per capita mortality. However, duration of mask wearing by the public was negatively associated with mortality. That it was, there was a protective effect of mask wearing. Internal lockdown requirements and viral testing policies were not associated in one way or another with mortality, which you would expect because mortality is so uh, much, a, such a small fraction of all the infections that you're not going to see that on testing. Um, but the, uh, the association of contact tracing, however, approached statistical significance. So that's, we clearly um, think that that is important. So the, the, the uh, conclusions were that in countries with cultural norms of government policy supporting public mask wearing, per capita mortality increased on average by 15% each week compared to 62% each week in the countries that didn't have those mask wearing policies. So they, mask wearing is not gonna be the only thing that can stop mortality, but remember mortality is related to many other factors as well, but mask wearing was clearly associated with reductions. So there are data, and I think I'll have to stop soon, but uh, can mask reduce symptoms? Um, well, one, one of my fairly close colleagues, George Rutherford at UCSF and his, uh, his colleague, Monica Gandhi wrote a, an editorial for the New England Journal recently that said, perhaps we are somewhat, uh, we are uh, subclinically providing a protection for people or what we call variolation, which is kind of like uh, basically smallpox vaccination, giving people a little dose of vaccine, of virus by wearing masks. And maybe that's why we're seeing less infections in the population because we are seeing reductions of overall mortality and it could be that perhaps by wearing masks, people are just getting less viral load uh, delivered to them by the people who are infected and wearing the masks. Um, but they didn't provide a whole lot of evidence for that. That was just a hypothesis on that part. Um, and then there, was, there were a number of um, rebuttals to this saying that that could be a dangerous approach. That is by saying, well, it's okay to go out and be sick and wear a mask because maybe you're actually helping the environment by essentially vaccinating people against the virus. There is no evidence that that works. Um, and my view is that the reason we're seeing less deaths and, um, and despite the fact that we're seeing more cases is just that at the beginning of the epidemic, we didn't know anything about this disease. 
we weren't masking properly. We weren't taking precautions because we didn't really understand the disease. And we were seeing very high risk people get sick and die early on because we weren't, we weren't, we didn't understand the natural history. It reminds me of the HIV days when the very early parts of the pandemic uh, really resulted in um, lots of people dying of full blown AIDS. And we don't see that anymore. And it's not because we have a vaccine. It's because we are testing people and we know that the vast majority, 90% plus people who have HIV don't have any symptoms at all. And we have in behavioral and other mitigation factors, drug in interventions to keep people from infecting others. So um, I think what we're seeing now is that we have a better way of identifying the vast majority of people who are gonna be infected and who don't have symptoms, uh, getting them out of circulation so that they don't propagate transmission. And actually we're doing a better job of learning how to take care of these patients once they do get sick and come in. And we are actually protecting our higher risk populations so that they are, sorry, I'm moving my cat. Um, so that, the, um, so that uh, we are protecting more of our high risk populations and they are less likely to now be sick. And in fact, we may have infected a lot of our high risk populations early on in the pandemic. So the idea that masks reduce symptoms um, is unproven and I wouldn't uh, take that uh, assumption that that's the case. However, masks can reduce transmission and we know that, that there's lots of evidence for that. So I will skip the daycare center data. We talked about it just to say that we know that daycares can be sources of transmission. However, they are not the actual sources. They are where people come together who have probably been infected in their communities. And in this particular study, from the MMWR from a couple months ago, um, the, um, what we did show was that the staff workers came in infected. They were, two, they were all infected. Two of the three staff workers that infected these three daycare centers were infected by somebody in their household who had symptoms, but who didn't know they were infected. So they came to work uh, not infected, uh, not knowing that the person at home was indeed infected with COVID. And that also speaks to the idea of, should we keep people at home if they're not sick, but if somebody at home is sick, but not known to be infected with COVID. So that's why we should be uh, doing better symptomatic screening. We also know that children did get infected, but they were very unlikely to get sick. Most of the kids had very mild symptoms, if, if at all. And children did spread disease, although um, not very often. One case, for example, of an eight month old who infected both its parents and that asymptomatic children could actually spread disease as well. Um, and then I won't go through the household transmission data except to say that it does occur. We know that anybody in the family can, and I'll send you these slides again, as I said, transmission can occur within households. The estimates vary widely. Kids can transmit as well as adults. Um, most transmission we're seeing around the country is occurring in household settings um, and all ages can transmit. It does appear that younger children are less likely to transmit disease, but they can also become infected themselves. Um, I am doing a household transmission study now, but I don't have time to go over those results and we are, are still in the middle of analyzing those data. So I will stop there and these are all the slides. Um, and within the references, if you want to go back and take a look at those. Thank you so much. Well, that was great. Um, really uh, helpful. Lots and lots of questions coming in. And we have about we have about five minutes. Um, I, I just very quickly wanted to um, make sure that we had uh, clarified something and then ask a question. The, the, when you the very early on the AAP data, where you talked about hospitalization rates, I think you said 0.5 to 6.7 percent was what they reported. And just want to um, that could also include the kids that are being hospitalized and getting universal screening uh, and are testing positive, even though they were admitted for a, a totally different reason. Which which, uh, which uh, at, at Packard is the vast majority of everybody. positives is, is those kids. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that that's just important for for for, um, for people to know that it's that it, that may over represent the true risk of hospitalization in, in kids. Um, the the uh, question that I wanted to ask sort of tying together masks and mode of transmission. Is it fair to say that if, if we are genuinely convinced that masks work that that in and of itself is further evidence of a droplet mode of transmission. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think they, yeah, absolutely. Because if, if masks didn't work, if masks didn't work, it would be because there was aerosol transmission. Masks exactly. don't prevent you from getting aerosols. Yeah, good. Yeah. I, I think that's helpful to, to mm -hmm. um, Rajni, do you want to try to field some of the, the questions in the Q&A? Yes. Thank you, Bonnie. That was excellent overview of um, both transmission and mask wearing. Uh, there were there are several questions about airline travel and the holidays that are coming up. Uh, so I think I will try and uh, figure one question so that you can answer that. Uh, the question is about how safe is long distance airline travel? And is it true that uh, the air filtration and circulation system in airlines negates risk of transmission? So I think you could probably cover the airline and how safe it, is it to congregate during the upcoming holidays? Yeah, so that's a great question. We've been talking to us, I won't say which airline, but we've been talking to a couple of airlines. Uh, they have wanted to ask us our, their, our opinion. Um, so yeah, absolutely. The, the filtration in the airlines, in the airplanes themselves, the cabin is extremely good. I mean, it's probably like an OR almost. They have really good um, filtration. They filter out uh, the air, their air exchanges are very high. So you're not going to see widespread transmission in the cabin. The problem is that the airline industry needs to fill that middle seat if they want to be, according to them, they need to fill that middle seat in order to be profitable. And we said, well, okay, there's an inherent problem here because if you want to be profitable and fill the middle seat, you're not going to fill it if people are afraid to sit next to an infected person. So, so I don't think the plane itself is going to infect you. It's going to be the person sitting next to you who's infected. That's the person who's going to infect you. So what we were trying to convince them to do is don't charge people for a test. Give them a free test or give them a discount on a test or something. Maybe give them a discount on their seat if they get a test, something like that. Because the testing of the people getting on the plane is A, going to make people feel safer and B, going to make them actually safer because you're going to keep the infected people off the planes. That is the key. So frankly, I would almost, I haven't gotten on a plane since February. Um, I've been driving to my family in Southern California. Fortunately, they're not that far away. Um, if I had to fly, which I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't, I would not sit next to somebody. So I would almost buy a seat next to me, especially if you're going to be on a long flight, because the longer you're sitting next to somebody who is infectious, I don't, you can mask, you can do all that other stuff. But at some point, you're gonna have to take that mask off to take a drink of water or eat something. And so I think uh, that is my concern. The other thing is there's a paper that just came out and I'll try to find the link. Remind me to send you the link, Rashni, of a, an airline that a, 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 a group of people who flew from Europe, uh, from one place in Europe to Ireland. And there were 40 something people on the flight. It was a big plane. So there were only 40, you know, 45 people on the plane, 13 of the people got infected on that plane. And if you see what happened, they were all wearing masks during the whole flight. Everybody was doing apparently what they were supposed to do. The problem is that two of the groups, there were four different groups of people on the plane who got infected and th that were somehow epidemiologically related. Two of those groups actually sat together in the lounge without masking before they got on the plane. So it doesn't help you to mask on the plane if you're gonna sit together and have drinks or whatever together before you get on the plane. So they infected each other, I assume. That was the link there. And they were on a seven and a half hour flight. That actually outbreak wound up creating an outbreak of over 50 people because then they went on to their different destinations and infected other people. So, um, the other thing that happened is that people, even though there were 42 people on the, this gigantic plane, they were all clustered together. So if I were getting on a plane, I would want to sit at least a few seats away. So if you look at the way the transmission occurred, it was very close. You were either sitting right next to the person or right across them from them in the aisle. On, aisle. So um, I think it's safe. I know a lot of people have flown to Europe to you know lots of places and not quarantined for two weeks. But if you're wearing a mask, you bring your own food, you clean your surfaces, you try to stay away from anybody sitting next to you. If you have to sit next to somebody, just be super careful about keeping that mask on and 
keeping your hands clean and wiping everything down or seeing if you can just be asked to be moved or, um, you know, or have it be your family member sitting next to you. So I've traveled to see my family, but we're in, we all get tested first and it's, there's only five of us or, you know, less than 10 people together. Thank you so much, Bonnie. I know we are on the hour right now. Um, there are so many questions and endless discussions that we can have, but I think for now, we will close. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs> Stay calm. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.